Hello viewers, and welcome to Amateur Hour, with me, Ben, the Amateur Exegete. Today is Saturday, October 16th, and on today's episode, I'll be playing for you my interview of Bernard Lamborel about his upcoming publication, To Be Done With Sodom. Before we get to that interview, let me briefly talk about what's been going on in my world. First, if you haven't watched it already, Amateur Hour Episode 5 that premiered in September featured my interview of Mark Edward on the subject of the Book of Revelation. We talked about the redaction of the book, some of the odd characters that stem from it, and even things like the meaning of the number 666. Head over to my channel on YouTube and give it a whirl. Second, several episodes of my new podcast, Bible Study for Amateurs, are available for consumption. I'll leave links in the video description. Third, my examination of Ray Comfort's scientific facts in the Bible continues. The latest covers Comfort's misreading of Job chapter 38, verses 12 through 14. Finally, last Saturday, I released a short video discussing references to Spain found in Paul's letter to the Romans. You might be thinking, Spain? Really? How dull? But the video is a reaction to one doozy of a meme from the Facebook group Exposing Religion that, well, just go watch the video when you're done with today's episode. I recently had the pleasure of talking with Bernard Lamborel, the author of a few books, including this one, The Covenant, on the origin of the Abrahamic faith by means of deification, as well as a new comic book that will drop in November entitled To Be Done With Sodom. In the conversation you're about to watch, Lamborel makes some surprising claims about the origin of the worship of Yahweh, the history of the biblical patriarchs, and much more. They are claims that he believes can be supported by various lines of evidence. So, here is my interview of Bernard Lamborel. If you adopt the perspective of a God, like most scholars do, just assume, of course, it's a story about God. It's Abraham making a covenant with God. But when you look at it from a secular perspective, you wonder, you go, okay, what happens with these kings? Well, next chapter, you know, you, you could expect these kings to either retaliate or make a covenant, right? I mean, with Abraham. And the next yeah. chapter is the covenant with God. And so, uh, so God makes a covenant, and, and the way I interpret it is basically um, these, this Eastern king that basically I, um, I uh, simulate with uh, Hammurabi uh, makes a covenant with Abraham in exchange for his loyalty, and, uh, and uh, the, the story keeps going. Well, welcome to another episode of Amateur Hour with me, the Amateur Exegete. Today, I have as my guest, Bernard Lamborel. So, Bernard, thank you for coming on my show. I appreciate You're you being welcome. here. It's a pleasure. Yeah, it's a pleasure, Ben. Looking forward to it. Yeah, this is the first time we've ever talked. Um, well, face to face, well, face to face, I guess yes. you could call it. Uh, we've interacted <laughs> on Twitter a bunch. Um <laughs> Uh, yeah. so just take a couple minutes, talk about yourself, um, you know, where you're from, that kind of stuff. Just let the people know who you are. Okay. Uh, well, my name is Bernard Lamborel. I'm a, uh, I guess you could call him a, uh, amateur historian or, uh, you know, and, uh, 
Uh, well, I guess we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, originally uh, born in Congo, Belgian parents, lived in Canada most of my life. Uh, embarked on a uh, long, seven-year-long road trip on an RV with my wife and uh, ended up in Mexico and loved Mexico so much that uh, this is now where we live. And um, uh, I, by trade, I'm an engineer in uh, electronics, automated production. So, you know, a bit of uh, mechanic software, electronics stuff. Okay. I did a lot of uh, 3D graphics design, uh, video processing stuff. So post-production film movies, that kind of stuff. Been oh, wow. Kind of part of my life and history. And now I'm more into... Uh, a cloud storage so i guess you could say cloud storage architect that type of stuff so uh yeah and uh, I, I work with a uh, uh bulgarian company uh and uh, that's what we do and it's it's been fun um and and, and yeah and, and my uh background in uh, in biblical studies is uh is kind of accident accidental i guess i i was raised my dad was um uh, I guess you could say an atheist and uh, my mom, my mom always been a believer. Uh, a little later, she turned uh, Mormon. And uh, so I've always had kind of this challenge in my head, curiosity, trying to, you know, when I see someone, someone completely dedicated to, to, um, to the scriptures and my dad being completely like, this is crap. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, at that point, my parents didn't live together, but still I was young enough and, and, and just yeah. curious. So I've, I've kind of always been interested by the spiritual aspect. I think it's a fundamental aspect of human beings. And uh, I think religions in general are, uh, can bring some positive things. And mm. so I've always kind of been tempted to go back to the good old Bible and read a little bit. And then um, my, uh, my skeptical skepticism and, and engineering background made me want to uh, uh, challenge it. And uh, so I've kind of, usually it's just ended up kind of flipping back the book, putting it back on the shelf and say, okay, I'll see you in five years from now. And mm. as I got older trying to, you know, maybe, okay, maybe now is the right time. You're going to find something that's going to talk to you, you know, and I'll grab the book again and start reading. And my God, that takes us back to 2003. So it's almost like almost 20 years ago. Oh, yeah. I grabbed the Bible and, and uh, I got drawn into this, this, this project. And so um, uh, as I, in 2009, I kind of published the first book, this one here in French. And, and that was really uh, nothing, that, that was really just kind of an investigation. And, uh, and at the time, I, 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 I put this, these ideas together that we're gonna talk about. And I had to ask a friend who knew somebody who was, um, in Collège de France at the time, and theology, and I said, "Could you can you run this by this guy and see if it make any sense if I should like do something with this?" And kind of the note I got back was, "Not only it needs it, it deserves to be published, but it needs to be published." And and that was kind of the impetus for for uh, getting into this uh, this project. So, yeah, because like you know, you said you're of, you're a you're a published author. Um, yeah, one well, of with which this is one here. Yeah, yeah. The Covenant. That one is kind of the, yeah, that one is kind of the, uh, <laughs> this one is the original one. This oh. one I self-published, the one you, you're holding. This one okay. was published by Editus. And uh, uh, this one, um, yeah, the one you're holding, I, actually the, the interesting story is that before I published this one, I reached out to some scholars, like the best known scholar in Montreal at the time, uh, who thought uh, Hebrew Bible and ancient Israel. And I wanted to meet with him and, and just see, you know, what he thought. And his feedback basically was, this is laughable. And uh, so I was like, okay, well, I mean, that's the best I can do. So um, <laughs> maybe if you don't mind, maybe you teach me. I, I want to learn, you know, I want to see where it's failing because everything I'm looking at kind of works. So yeah. Uh, 
show me if you want to please teach me. And so I signed up, I signed up for a master in theology under his, uh, I guess, under his, uh, his uh, uh, tutelage. Yeah. I wouldn't say control. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> French. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and so, uh, you know, for years, kind of a part-time master and, um, and I did all the curses and all the classes. I, I really loved it. I mean, I, I really enjoyed the academic aspect and uh, and i it, it really fed me in in so much stuff and uh, but we had made an agreement uh which was he didn't want anything to do with history and so uh when i when i wrote my thesis uh, my memoir actually um <laughs> i couldn't hold myself i had to plug my stuff into it and uh, he basically said no we had an agreement i'm not going <laughs> with you there and I, I guess at the time, my ego was a little too strong. And I figured, I said, ah, I don't need that freaking paper. I mean, you know, I've got all the information I need now. I can just go out and publish this thing and everybody's yeah. going to love it. Right. And um, so, you know, hindsight, I should have probably uh, uh, <laughs> bend a little bit and just complete it for the paper. And, you know, but anyway, so that's the rest of the history. But the book you're holding, that one mm-hmm. is, it's got much more of, uh, the little more of the academic uh, yeah. to support and it's not an academic book you know I don't want people to think it is but it, it has more references and, and and more support for academic it's just an extension of this one so um, yeah yeah so sorry so just real quick get what's give us an yeah. overview of this book uh, before we talk about your, your more recent work, because this is the subtitle sure. to this one is on the origin of the Abrahamic faith by means of deification. That's a mouthful. Yes. A lot of people may not know what the heck you're talking about here. So kind of get just break down <laughs> just really brief yeah. what the book's about. Yeah. So the, the, the idea is basically to challenge um, the, the, the paradigm of a, uh, of a deity uh, in terms of the covenant. So I, I believe that um, the uh, I believe that the story of Abraham, uh, which is perceived as a myth and as an alleg- allegory today, uh, actually has a historical background, a secular background, where Abraham is somebody who existed, made a covenant with a Mesopotamian king. At a time when the cult of the dead and the powerful ones were being deified and elevated to the status of gods. And uh, I think when we adopt that paradigm and that perspective and we look at the not only the story of Abraham, but uh, even the evolution of the uh, of the stories in the Bible, we get a much clearer picture of the origin of where that story come from and where the Bible actually and the God of Israel evolved from. So that's in a nutshell, that's kind of the, uh, the, uh, the quest. <laughs> yeah. It's a very terrestrial uh, explanation, not, not uh, um, and, con- and controversial yeah. too. Like it's very, it's a very controversial thesis that you have. Yeah. Um, yeah. So let's talk about your most recent project, which is this right here, which you were gracious enough to get me a copy of the of, of PDF to be done with Sodom. Um, so yes. first, why why a comic book? Uh, well, you know, when I came out with the uh, the covenant, uh, the book, the covenant, there, um, I realized that four hundred pages to try to convince somebody of a story or or a perspective that has very little credibility to start with. You know, I mean, you just every every scholar tried that I approach and unless I get half an hour of discussion with them mm. uh, usually I, I fail the smell te- the smell test you know I mean the, the yeah. just the just mentioning well I think Abraham lived the phone mm. hangs up you know <laughs> so it, it's it's very difficult to ask scholars or anyone to pick up a book and uh, and dive into it you know, if, if they don't already feel like, eh, actually, you know, maybe there's something that makes sense here. Uh, so the idea of the comic is really to try to make it much more easier for people to understand what I'm trying to do, because um, you don't have to read 400 pages. You can just flip through a comic, which is much more attractive 
Mm. And, and also, I think as you read a book, your brain kind of goes and, and reflects and thinks and, and does all this thing while you're yeah. reading. While when you're kind of going through a comic, it's a little easier to just kind of go with the flow. And, and then when you kind of close the comic, you realize that, geez, actually, I think, I think that kind of makes sense. I didn't see any problem with this. So mm -hmm. that's, that was kind of the idea. And I think nonfiction comic, generally speaking, there's, I, I wouldn't say there's a trend, but I think there, there is something to be said that in the scientific community, some people are using nonfiction comic as a way to take complex ideas and kind of bring them to a level that is easier to accept or to yeah, yeah. Do, you, do you know who uh I don't, you may not know do you know who jack chick is or was i don't know if he's still alive no, no he so no, jack so he yeah he he was a he's a christian or he was a christian and he had these little comic book tracks they were chick, mm. we, call, we call them chick tracks. So you'd put them wherever, you know, and they were comic books to lead you to Jesus. But I remember as a kid having a comic book of, of his uh, rendition of the Bible. And yeah. oh my God, Bernard, he did the scene of Noah's Ark. And like, like one of the images was a, was a child, was a, a man holding up his baby as the floodwaters rose. It was, it was so great. It scarred me <laughs> very dramatic. for years. Like it was, it was very dramatic. Like, oh my gosh! Wow. Um, but it was a comic book, you know. So I know comics can have a huge impact. Um, so mm. I thought, but I thought it was really interesting the way that you decided to do that, uh, as opposed to this, which is really a, a tome. This is a, mm. a a pretty large book. I mean, when it get when you get down right down to it. Um. So so so, to be done with Sodom is is I guess a summary a uh, like a, yes. a condensing of the covenant is that what you would say yeah it, it's basically a retelling of the story of abraham from a secular perspective from this perspective of the inhabitants of sodom uh and you know because i believe that, that the whole story of abraham revolves around um essentially around the control of sodom even though from a it, it may sound weird from a religious perspective, mm -hmm. but when you actually dive into the story and you look at it from a secular perspective and you realize that, um, you know, that th this was a trade corridor between Mesopotamia and Egypt and, uh, and essentially, uh, you know, the, the, the story of the Sodomites, even in the Bible, starts with a Sodom a, camp, a, a punitive campaign from four Eastern Kings because they are revolting. They've yeah. been, they've been, yeah. Walk, walk us through that story. Cause you're, you, you know, your, your account, this, this, your both the covenant and this comic are based on the biblical text. Um, yes. Specifically uh, Genesis chapters 14 and following. So walk us through those texts just in brief. I know there's a lot to it, okay. but just, just walk yeah. us through those chapters. Sure. So, so yeah, in Genesis 14, and this is interesting because this is a chapter that most scholars kind of tend to ignore and everybody kind of flip through and, you know, because it, it doesn't really talk about God, right? So mm -hmm. the, the story is actually very important. It's the story of the Sodomites that has been vassal of these, that from, of this uh, Eastern king, Mesopotamian king. And after 12 years, they decide they've had enough. They decide to revolt. And soon enough, there's a punitive campaign that comes to put them back in their place. And, uh, and part of the punitive campaign or part of that story is the fact that Lot, which is the nephew of Abraham, happens to live in Sodom at that point. And he's taken hostage and he's taken away. And that takes Abraham into the story because Abraham needs to basically recoup is uh, save his nephew. So he chases these Eastern Kings, catch up with them near uh, Damas and uh, basically attacks them by night, brings them back, brings all the goods and the people back. And, and at that point, he's celebrated by the King of Sodom, Melchizedek blesses him. And, uh, and then you don't hear of these four Eastern Kings anymore. Mm -mm. So why is that story sitting there in the Bible? And, and, and again, if you, if you adopt the perspective of a 
God, like most scholars do, just assume, of course, it's a story about God. It's Abraham making a covenant with God. But when you look at it from a secular perspective, you wonder, you go, okay, what happens with these kings? Well, next chapter, you know, you, you could expect these kings to either retaliate or make a covenant, right? I mean, with Abraham. And the next yeah. chapter is the covenant with God. And so, uh, so God makes a covenant, and, and the way I interpret it is basically um, these, this Eastern king that basically I, um, I uh, simulate with uh, Hammurabi uh, makes a covenant with Abraham in exchange for his loyalty. And, uh, and uh, the, the story keeps going where now Abraham needs a heir and uh, he can't have an heir because he's married with his half sister and she's not going to give him an heir. So, you know, what does he do? He takes his uh, handmaiden, Hagar, has a, mm -hmm. heir, uh, has a son, which is Ishmael with Hagar. And then uh, obviously Sarah is not happy and uh, the Lord is not happy. Because uh, presumably, uh, Agar being an Egyptian, uh, it creates a bit of a conflict. You know, if Ishmael becomes inherit the land, uh, which side is he going to take if there is a uh, if there is a conflict between Egypt and Mesopotamia? So yeah. the Lord basically comes back and says, "Okay, no, you you got to have a child with Sarah, uh, not with Agar." And Abraham tries again, <laughs> doesn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, and eventually, eventually, the, the funny thing is, you, you read it in the Bible, you know, the Lord shows up and says, okay, where's Sarah? And, uh, well, wait, she's in the tent. Next thing you know, uh, the Lord visits Sarah in the tent. And uh, nine months later, Isaac is born. Uh, so who fathered Isaac? Well, again, if you look at it from a religious perspective, it's the spirit of God who, you know, helped Sarah become pregnant. But if you look at it from a secular perspective, it's pretty clear who the father is. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and so same thing in, in Genesis 19, uh, God keeps hearing that these sodomites, you know, they're still a troublemakers. And so um, again, you know, you, you realize that the Lord needs to, do away with these guys. You know, he's got to, he's got to show, he's got to basically show uh, strength and, and put them back in their place. Mm -hmm. And so he, he talks to Abraham and Abraham tries to convince him because obviously Abraham is kind of stuck because he's, he's allied. He's become an ally with these Sodomites. And uh, anyway, at the end of the day, the Lord decides to destroy the city. And uh, a little later, um, he asked Abraham to sacrifice his son to show loyalty. And, and for me, that was the, the first big question mark when I hit that spot in the story, because um, it didn't make sense that if the Lord fathered Isaac, it wouldn't make sense that he's asking Abraham to sacrifice his, the fruit of his loin. Yeah. So it must have been Ishmael, right? And, and when I ran into that, I was, you know, that's like, 20 years ago or so, I thought, well, that, 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 that doesn't work. So, you know, I figured, okay, well, I'm done. <laughs> Just <laughs> wrap this project up, move on with life. <laughs> but, uh, I, I was a little curious and there was this thing called internet. And uh, so I, I, I thought, first I thought I was, I was just going to check to see if any scholar might have suggested that maybe Ishmael was the son that Abraham meant, was meant to sacrifice. And and, and, and I was shocked because I didn't know at the time, I didn't know nothing about the Bible at the time. Uh, I, I was shocked to realize that for the Muslims, that's the one thing they disagree with Christ mm -hmm. uh, Christians and Jews. They, they agree on the whole story, but not on the son. The son yep. to be sacrificed for the Muslim is Ishmael. Yep. And, and when I realized that, I'm like, okay, there, there has to be a reason why that particular thing they disagree on it's and it they they the quran doesn't say it's ishmael the quran doesn't spell any name it's just a tradition that states it's ishmael and uh, and anyway that was the beginning of the quest and and really tried to dig and see how far i could take this this query you know where would it fall apart and uh well 
20 years later, it's, I, I still haven't been able to fail it in, 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 a, in a way that, you know, come to a point where, I mean, any hypothesis, if you bring the, a fact, just one fact that you can't refute, the whole hypothesis falls apart. Yeah. And I, and I haven't been able to find one fact so far. I mean, lots of conclusions, a lot of conclusions mm-hmm. in terms of interpretation of, you know, how scholars interpret certain facts, but the facts themselves, uh, no. Yeah. Well, let's go back to Genesis chapter 14, um, yeah. because this is kind of the linchpin for yeah. partly much of the story. Now, mm-hmm. as you've already alluded to, this is a, a narrative that is befuddling in many ways. Um, I know that for many, uh, especially some of the older documentarians, for, for well, the source critics, had a hard time placing the story. I think more modern. There's more modern attempts to place it. Uh, I think Joel Baden puts it in J, if I remember correctly. I think uh, Richard Elliott Friedman does too. Um, but the story is just weird. It's just a weird story, and. And it's for that reason, and, and some of the names that are there, that a lot of scholars, like you said, kind of just dismiss it. They kind of just mm-hmm. toss it to the side and say, well, in the notes that I sent over to you, uh, Ronald Hendel in the HarperCollins Study Bible says this is a learned exercise in invented <laughs> history. And he's got a point. Some of the names there are just, they look like they're composite names. They're plausible names. Some of them are. But they just look like mm-hmm. somebody's he knows some names of some people and throws them together to create characters. But you think that there is a ring of truth to this story. You yeah. think there's a, some meat to it. Why why think that? Why why do you think that there is anything of any historical value in in that little chapter there? That little weird chapter in Genesis. Well, uh, maybe precisely because it's weird and it doesn't fit, <laughs> that it explains that there's a reason why it's there. Um, you know, I mean, it, it's funny because <laughs> Handel, uh, I mean, I, I, he, he writes some really cool stuff on, uh, you know, just how old the, uh, yeah. the, 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 the Hebrew, Hebrew Bible is. And, and it's actually quite interesting because he talks about Joel Biden you just mentioned here and and he he, he complains he complains about <laughs> that type of interpretation which is really based on uh, a late a late interpretation of the text or a late composition so he he is actually um you know it, it's funny because on the one hand most scholars recognize and acknowledge that genesis 14 has some of the oldest hebrew Fine in it, you know some of the uh, some of the, uh, uh, the, the, the 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 phrasing, the wording, and all that, and uh, and at the same time they discard it, mm-hmm. and and I think the reason they discard it is because they can't see how it fits. Yeah, um, and and uh, and 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 also I do believe, and that's just my own personal take. I didn't write or investigate that very deeply, but there is. I believe a lot of roots in the words of Genesis 14. I mean, I, I did some uh, uh, historical criticism and, and, uh, and, and textual criticism when I was part of the, uh, my Hebrew classes. And I suspect that the whole story of Abraham initially was written in Akkadian. And uh, if the story, you know, if the covenant had been made with a Mesopotamian king, that would make sense. Yeah, yeah. And, and the reason I say that, because there's a lot of words that we just can't really explain, that when you look at them from an Akkadian perspective, it makes more sense. Uh, I mean, I'll take one example, Melchizedek, you know, Melchizedek, king of Salem. Scholars are going around in circles around Salem, Right. And because uh, they can't fit Salem, Salem doesn't exist. It's not a city, you know. Yeah, they all say, "Oh, it must have been Jerusalem." Well, mm. there's no evidence for that. Uh, and 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 when you look again at the story from a perspective, from a secular perspective, you realize that Melchizedek is not the one receiving the tithe; he's the one giving the tithe, most likely. Uh, 
that that is totally open in the text as to who receives it. Um, and, uh, and, and also King of Salem, uh, the root of the word could be interpreted as uh, uh, instead of Mel, uh, sorry, Melek Salam, which would be King of Salem, mm-hmm. could be Malka, uh, Malka Salam, uh, which, uh, which basically would mean the, uh, uh, the uh, geez, uh, it's a little far back now, uh, the advisor of peace, because Shalom is peace, and uh, Malka is an advisor to the king. And so Malka Shalom could be the advisor of peace to the king of Sodom. And in that role, it makes mm. total sense that he's actually uh, blessing Abraham in a covenant between the king of Sodom and Abraham. And he's taking the bread and the wine, which is a very typical of a covenant to yeah. celebrate. And uh, so anyway, there are interpretations like this, which, um, and, and another interpretation, which I think is, is kind of interesting in Genesis 14 is uh, everywhere we interpret, Abraham raised a hand to swear that he won't accept anything from the king of Sodom. And, mm-hmm. and yet, uh, if you look in the, uh, in the uh, Hebrew Bible, there's not a single place where raising the hand means to swear. Uh, in every single instance, raising the hand means to fight. And, and indeed, in my interpretation, Abraham fought the Lord to save Lot and the people of Sodom. And, and, and actually, two sentences before, Melchizedek blesses the Lord and thanks the Lord for having put the enemies in the hands of Abraham. And that's, you know, it's just the proximity, the closeness, uh, you know, just everything kind of jives. Everything wants to fit uh, when interpreted that way. Yeah. So that's why I um, think the story is original. Yeah. Well, so let's, let's kind of go to a couple of different places where, um, you know, especially where I have difficulty. The first mm-hmm. is Sodom itself. So mm-hmm. you're placing Sodom in the Siddim Valley. And mm-hmm. but <laughs> um, Sodom is, is kind of like a, a like a slippery eel. Every time you try to get a hold of mm-hmm. where it is, it just kind of pops out. Um, why are you so confident, number one, that you can place it there in your um, in your argument, but also that it even existed in the first place? Like why this is a city we can't find. It was just, it just, where the hell is it? <laughs> you know, why, yeah. why do you think it existed? Well, I, I think the reason it existed is because um, I, I like to take the analogy of a tapestry. Okay. You, you look in the back side of a tapestry. What do you see? You, you kind of see something, but it's really hard to see what it is. Right. And, and you think you're looking maybe at the right thing. And then all of a sudden you flip it and you realize, oh my God, I was looking at the backside, you know? <laughs> and all along when you were looking in the backside, you didn't realize it was the backside. But when you look at the, the, at the, on the right side, you realize that can't be the wrong side. You know, I was looking, it, it's obvious. It becomes self-evident because there's no way it could be the other way, mm-hmm. right? And so I, I spent so much time looking at this story and, and trying to figure where it didn't fit, that everything wants to fit, that I'm not sure where Sodom is. You know, I mean, for the comic, I had to draw it somewhere. <laughs> yeah. All I can imagine, right? And I, I just figured, well, I draw it where everybody else tend to tend to put it because- Yeah, that general area, for, yeah. Yeah, it's that general area. It's on the King's Highway, which was mm-hmm. The, 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 high, the main commercial road between Egypt and Mesopotamia. And if the Sodomites had been troublemakers, they would have been along that road somewhere. And, um, and, and so it's close to Hebron where Abraham, Abraham was. Um, so it kind of makes sense that it was there. Um, but 
you know, in tr- as to where it is, no <laughs> idea. <laughs> well, have you paid any attention to the recent drama over the boli that they, I mean, I, I've only just paid a little bit of attention. I don't really care that yeah, me much. Too. I mean, yeah. I don't know. Um, yeah. 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 You know, I tend, I, well, <laughs> well, you don't think all, it was destroyed they, by an asteroid or by a bullet. Anyways, you think it was an attack from mm-hmm. um, this very human King. Um, yes. <laughs> so it is. Now, really... it, it doesn't mean that two stories haven't been conflated. Right. I mean, if, if okay. for whatever reason, this story of the, uh, how did you call it? This uh, galactic blast, whatever uh, <laughs> uh, did occur, you know, I'm sure that would have left an impact on, on the people in the area. And maybe they would have conflated the two stories, you know, these were bad guys, whatever, you know, so yeah. who knows, but I, I don't think it, it would have been extremely to me. It makes, it, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't jive that it would have been exactly there. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. It, you know but yeah. <laughs> and, and sometimes, God sometimes works in I, mysterious ways. Yeah, ex- exactly. <laughs> that's it. And that's every time I hear stories like this, I think, I think that's, this is what apologists are going to do. This is what they're going to do. Yeah. You're giving them ammo. And yeah. um, exactly. let's talk about Abraham. Okay. This is a similar issue that I have. Abraham mm-hmm. seems yeah. too convenient of a character to have been a, a real historical person. I mean, I mean, his name, first of all, first of all, you know, uh, mm-hmm. it means father. He becomes uh, from Avram to Avrahim. You know, he's, he's, it just seems way too convenient that this character becomes literally a father and the father of a multitude. Um, but mm-hmm. again, you think uh, that he really was a historical person. In fact, you even think, all the way down to uh, Jacob and the sons of Israel, if I remember correctly from reading your book, you think these mm-hmm. were in all likelihood historical uh, individuals. But let's mm-hmm. just focus on Abraham. Um, why? Why are you so convinced Abraham existed? Is it more of this? It just fits uh, in. It's just fitting together. Yeah, it's just that the story would make no sense. Like, could not hold if he did not exist. So it, it's it's kind of. Uh, I, I I don't know if Abraham existed. Um, maybe he didn't, but the story could not exist if he hadn't existed because nobody ever. I mean, I, it's been twenty years. I've been trying to find if anyone had ever thought of Abraham's Lord as a human, and and mm-hmm. it's worth taking a minute to think about this because. And I only found one. A philosopher, not a biblical scholar, but uh, Herbert Spencer. He's the only one who uh, suggested that, you know, just looking at the story from his perspective, of course, he's making a covenant with a man. But (laughs) that was was a long time ago. Now, I have to look at the context, you know. I mean, first of all, Jewish tradition claims that uh, this story dates from the Bronze Age. Okay, Mm -hmm. let's give them the, you know, the benefit of the doubt. Let's look at the Bronze Age. Well, what's in the Bronze Age? We have cult of the dead, pagans, mm-hmm. you know, uh, Baals, Asherah. And uh, that's, there's no Yahweh in the Bronze Age. Right? No, we yeah. all know that. Um, and, and, and what is the cult of the dead? Well, the cult of the dead is basically, it's, and, and uh, Francesca Stavacopoulou does a great job. And, and same thing for Theodore Lewis at discussing the cult of the dead and the importance the cult of the dead had, especially with regard to land inheritance. What is the story of Abraham? It's all about land inheritance, yep. right? Mm-hmm. And what does Abraham keeps talking about? The God of the father, the God of my father, right? The God of the father of Abraham. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it, it's, it's clear that the context if that story took place, it would have mm-hmm. taken place in the context of the cult of the dead. And, uh, and, and, and I believe that the secular interpretation that I'm uh, offering fits perfectly in that mold. You know, Abraham was a nomad for all, then, you know, according to yeah. tradition and all that. Um, and, and therefore, when he's offered the, the ability to gain this land for him and his descendants in exchange for his loyalty, because, I mean, what, what's the need? What's the quest here? 
uh, Mesopotamian king trying to preserve this corridor, this trade corridor. He's 800 kilometers away. He needs a local ally that's going to keep these damn sodomites in the control. And he seems to have the right attitude towards them, right? He mm -hmm. saved their ass. Mm -hmm. and, and so they're willing to listen maybe to him. And so the covenant makes sense. And, uh, and, and, and so it's all these pieces that could not fit if Abraham had not existed. And, yeah. and, and so it's, I'm not expecting to find any trace of the man, <laughs> but I think, I, you know, uh, uh, it, it, I, I just think that if he existed, it helps us solve so many issues in terms of mm -hmm. how we read and understand the history of the Bible. And, and where and why, why tradition says it started there. Because today we have maximalists, I mean, very few maximalists. It's essentially the evangelicals that are yeah, left yeah. over maximalists, right? Yep. They keep claiming, yes, 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 yes. But yep. obviously their interpretation doesn't fit the reality we're seeing. Because the reality we're seeing, there is no monotheism, right? We know oh, yeah, it no. was all, yeah, not at all pagan tales and all that. Exactly. So... How do you reconcile all of that? Yeah, exactly. Um, so let's talk about um, <laughs> what is probably uh, your, well, maybe not. To me, it's very controversial that the king that Abraham is associated with is none other than Hammurabi. Mm -hmm. um, not digital um, Hammurabi. Yeah, not yet. <laughs> Hi, Josh. Yeah, not, not Josh and Megan. Um, <laughs> so who was Hammurabi, first of all? I mean, um, and what role? And why was, him? Yeah, why why him of all of all people? Yeah. I mean, uh, as I explain in my book, um, again, you know, I'm trying, I, uh, I kind of work backward, right? I mean, if mm -hmm. Abraham existed, if this story took place, then we must be able maybe to find some traces or at least we should be able to see in the political context of the region who would have been the prime suspect, right? And I, I, I kind of looked through all the different powerful men because it would have been a powerful man. It would have not have oh, been, yeah. you know, a nobody. And, uh, and, and so if you look through the history of the powerful men of the region, uh, especially in the time frame, more or less, you know, within plus or minus 200 years, 300 years of what Jewish tradition claims, uh, Hammurabi stand out for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, there's a reference to Amraphel in Genesis 14, which some of the early biblical scholars thought maybe that's Hammurabi, and that was later kind of rejected for lack of evidence. Um, but then, uh, then you, when you look at the, his lifespan is very unique, and the information we have in terms of the dates are, are, are actually quite interesting in the sense that when you use the dates in the Bible, and you will try to align them with the dates in history and, and around Hammurabi's uh, life, there are some very unique and very intricate uh, joints that you can do, which leaves very little room for, uh, for chance, if you will. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, so that's why I thought, well, this this could make sense. I mean, we know that Hammurabi was he's the sixth, he's the sixth uh, uh, king of the Babylonian Empire. He expanded, he inherited Babylon, but then he expanded his territory all the way to Syria. Um, it's it's unclear if he had any dealings with the Levant. So that part we don't know. It's it's we haven't we don't have any historical record showing he had uh, dealings with the Levant. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, that's open. But we know he was revered and celebrated mm -hmm. as a god by a number of people. And he, you know, we know about his code of law and uh, 
yeah, I think there's there's a number of a number of facts that fit well. I would put it that way. It doesn't mean it has to be him, but it certainly fits really well if it was him. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're just about out of time. So um, mm-hmm. I have one more question I want to get to, but I don't, I think I'm going to wait. Uh, I'd like to have you on again sometime in, in next year though. Um, okay. Especially after this comic comes out and it circulated some. Um Sure. And I've had a chance to read it again because I've already read your book twice and I'm planning on, on reading it a third time in January. Wow. I think it is. I try to schedule. There's certain books I'm, I read through intentionally uh, either to write a review, which is what I'm going to do with yours. Um, I was going to write a review the first time I read it, but I thought, no, I need to read it again. So I read it again. I thought, well, now I'll write the review. And I started writing it. I thought, no, I need to wait. <laughs> Hey, you you and there's another book i'm reading that I've, i'm reading a fourth time that i've i want to write a review about but i just i need to reread it to really get through it um but i, I you know I, i'll have you on again to talk more about uh some other questions that i have and to press you maybe on them um especially sure. the origin of the name yahweh because that you have oh. I, I don't want to get into it because you have such an interesting view um, and people, if you get the comic book, he's got a really good little chart that kind of breaks it down, but you need to get the book because he talks about it a little bit more in there. Um, it's just, I don't, I don't know how I feel about it, Bernard. I don't know how I feel about it, um, <laughs> but it's really interesting. It really is. So either way, get the comic book, everybody just do that. So uh, as, as we close, what are some resources uh, besides the covenant, besides to be done with Sodom, that you would recommend sure. um, for people who are interested in in not just your view, but just the general history. Sure. Um, I I think the most important thing. Scholars, most biblical scholars, are aware that the cult of the dead was something in ancient Israel. Mm-hmm. They view it as something foreign. You know, they say, "Oh, this was where it was." And now we have Israel. No. Deep learn about what the cult of the dead is. And then see how the evolution of the Bible fits in there. And, and I think that's the most important thing that has been neglected. And, and, and I think if more people did that, they would probably have a different take. And, and they would better understand, or hopefully I think, uh, yeah, you know, I, yeah. I don't think I don't. I don't think many people would realize um, that there even was really a cult of the dead, um, mm-hmm. or that it played such a, a significant role. I think a lot of that is because yeah. how how great the redactors of the Pentateuch mm-hmm. and the authors of the Bible generally were at hiding it, at at glossing, exactly. at, you know, at just masking over it. They were masters yeah. of it, um, but it's yeah. all over the ancient For a reason. East. Exactly. For exactly. A reason. Exactly. Um, so if there was one thing from our conversation today that you would want viewers to walk away, you know, just something they can hold on to and, and, and really kind of uh, ponder, uh, what would that be? Hey, they can get the comic for 99 cents pre-order. <laughs> 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 no, seriously, I think, yeah, I mean, Hey, I, how can I say that? It's been a lonely journey. Uh, nobody, nobody is very much supportive of, of what I'm doing because it fits nowhere, you know? I mean, it doesn't fit in traditional scholarship. It doesn't fit with the apologist. I'm, I'm the enemy of everybody kind of thing. <laughs> and and uh, it, it, not the enemy, but, you know, I mean, it's it doesn't sound really interesting and and yet i i believe there's something there there's a gem that needs to be exploited i'm not saying i'm right you know i i just want to have a conversation around this and, yeah and i want more people to to challenge the ideas you know and uh 
you know, I'd love to get on with my life and spend more time with my <laughs> grandchild and all that, uh, you know, so <laughs> folks, you know, <laughs> Well, you know, plenty. <laughs> uh, I uh, a few a uh, couple months back, I interviewed um, Mira Scriptura. I don't know if you've ever inter- interacted with him on Facebook, mm-hmm. on Twitter. Yes. Um, but he's yes. a lot. He, you, yes. he, interesting. He, the two of you, they, you just resemble each other in the way you think about <laughs> these texts because it's just like you read it. You read Genesis fourteen, and you see this this historical narrative. Mm-hmm. I look at Genesis Genesis fourteen, and I think this is a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> like this is mm-hmm. made up nonsense, mm-hmm. um, but you, you and Mira Scriptura, you bring an interesting perspective, and mm-hmm. regardless of whether I think you're right, you get me to think. Period. Mm-hmm. Like you really get my brain thinking. Now this this seems plausible. Why don't I agree with this? And um, it's just it, it's a fascinating new angle, um, and that I think is even more of even if you you know. Whether you're wrong or right, that is even more mm-hmm. important because you're asking questions mm-hmm. to get us to dig deeper. Um, so I think that's the most your most valuable contribution to the conversation mm-hmm. um, because, like you, you know, I'm an amateur. You know, I, I mm-hmm. I'm not an originalist. Uh, I just want to look at the text and investigate it. And you know, you you are bringing to the table a new a new perspective. So so where can we find your Material. Where, where do we need to go? Who do we need to, to uh, uh, bother? Well, to the get website this stuff? is uh, yeah. The website is earthlycovenant.com. Oh, that's right. Can you, uh, the the book is available. Yep. <laughs> the There's book the is book. available on. Uh, you're gonna love it. Amazon. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, it's also available on the uh, Smashwords and uh, Barnes and Nobles. You know, a couple of places. Um, but yeah, I mean, you, you might find some interesting additions on the, on the website, you know, a couple of blog posts, whatever. Um, Mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, I mean, by all means, please engage, reach out. Let's have a, let's have a conversation. All right. And again, tell us when that comic book drops. So comic book, comic book drops on November 1st. Mm-hmm. And uh, the reason it drops on November 1st is because that coincides <laughs> with the uh, El yep. Dia de las Muertas in, I didn't even in think about Mexico. That. And, it's, and it, it's amazing the parallels that yeah. exist between that celebration and the way people celebrate it and how ancient Israel most likely experienced that's, it. That's clever. That's clever. That's a nice little connection. I like that. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> well, Bernard. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, I'm going to have to have you on again to talk more about this, especially as I find more stuff that I either agree with or most likely disagree with. <laughs> but um, again, you, you make me think, and it's this has been a great, a great experience for me. So thank you again. Hey, thank you, Ben. It's been All a right. pleasure. Bye bye. Cheers. Well, that does it for this episode of Amateur Hour. To learn more about Lamborell's work, check out the links in the video description, and you'll also find there links to some of the work that I've been doing. And if you want to support my work, just head over to amateurexegete.com and hit the support button. Thanks for watching.